Good morning, Isaiah. Top of the evening to you. I don't know why my camera's way over there. It should be right there. Hello, Lizette, 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 Lizette. How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Can y'all hear me? Hear me? Hear me? Hear me? Hear me? <laughs> I know I'm slow. Uh oh. Hold on. Hold on, wait a minute. I knew something was wrong. There I go. Woo, some more light. Hey, Sister Tanya, my apologies. Now I can see what I saw when I seen it. Good morning, top of the morning, evening, afternoon, day to everyone. What's up, Booby? This is Kingdom Expectations Bible Exploration Class. I am the senior pastor, Apostle Dr. Antonio E. Wright, senior founding pastor of Kingdom Explorations Ministries and Kingdom Explorations Ministerial Fellowship, AKA the doc, keep it simple. So bless the Lord for everybody. You said I don't rub my glasses. I don't probably rub the plastic off because some grease got on them and I can't see what I saw when I seen it, but I'm gonna try. So hello everyone. I pray that everybody has had a blessed, uh, uh, a blessed. We're still celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. We're still in that feast. It's several days. Um, so excuse me. Can't seem to get enough water. So God bless everybody. Hello applesauce. We'll wait a few moments, just a couple of minutes here, as we get ready to go and launch out 746. Wow, yeah, we gotta go. Hey, Nikki, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Y'all hear me, Lima Charlie, right? I hope so. Can't get no louder than this. Can't get no louder than this. So we'll wait a couple more seconds. How many people? I can't count. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six people are on. It says 11 on my dash cam. So I don't know, please remember if you're following me, hey Christy, if you're following me on my fa on my personal Facebook page, I can't see your remarks or anything. That's something I'd have to look at later. Oh, let's see, let me, maybe, let me take a glance. You know I'm slow. Pray for me tonight, I'm just a tad bit, just a tad bit, just a tad bit tired, just a tad bit, just a tad bit, just a tad bit tired, so. Uh, Sometimes I get cuckoo when I'm tired, so hopefully I won't. But I'm trying to find my page, and maybe I can answer you guys. Hey, Dr. Carolyn, I can answer you guys this way. Damn. Here we go, loop the loop. Here we go, loop. Deacon Gary. Okay, I got Deacon Gary and uh, Sister Sandra. And uh, look like Sister Tanya Pinson. They're on my Facebook page. So y'all, I can't see y'all on here. And I'm not gonna always be looking down on my Facebook, but I think that's where you're at. So let me see. I got the C rights over there. So y'all are following me on my personal page. So I'll see y'all remarks later. I glance down here periodically. That's too much glancing, right? I, I got my head spinning. I'm like I'm on cloud now. So let's get this started. So that's enough people, 15. Praise the Lord, bless you, let's go. Father, we bless you, we glorify you. We thank you as always, God, for life, health, and strength. Thank you for a mind to serve you, Father, in spirit and in truth. If we've committed any sins against you or against your word, we ask that you forgive us of those sins and give us a clean heart, a mind, in which we might serve you in spirit and in truth. God, we want to thank you and glorify you for all things that have been said and done in our lives this day. And as always, God, we pray that thy kingdom come and that will might be done in our lives on earth, just as it is in heaven. We pray that the meditation of our hearts uh, and, and our thought process might be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And God, today, as we go into your word, we pray that you bless us with revelation, knowledge, spiritual wisdom, and divine understanding. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. You know, I have this, this problem, right? When I'm praying, um, getting ready to pray, right? I have all these thought processes going through my head and I get I lose thought of how I'm praying. So I don't know if that happens to anybody else. I'll be things I'm wanting to pray. And then when I get ready to pray, it just goes ching out the window. 
Uh, so it's pretty interesting, right? We're still in the Feast of Tabernacles. I'm going to share several things tonight. We're still in the Feast of Tabernacles. Something I'm going to do next year uh, that I've never done is I'm going to I'm going to go all in into on the on, on the Tabernacle feast. So the Feast of Tabernacles, what the what the Jewish people do, and they still do it even to this day. And I know some believers that are actually practicing it like that. They actually build tents or booths, if you will. And they're not all put together, or whatever. They got holes in the wood and things of that nature to replicate the children of Israel being in the wilderness for 40 days, right? It replicates that. So, so for seven nights, they sleep in these booths or tents, if you will. Hey, Pamela. Okay, Pamela, you're on my side. So, hey, I just happened to look down down there. So they they actually, so the lady at the bank, I talked to her today. So what she did was she made a tent in her house because she has too much property and no fence. And so I told my wife next year, I'm going to either do a tent in my house uh, or if I have a deck, I do it on my deck. Or, you know, I'm country. I just put it in the backyard, right? I'm going to just do a tent and I'm going to sleep in the tent for seven days, right? I'm going to see, I'm going to replicate uh, uh, the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. So I'm going to check that out, right? I'm looking forward to that. Uh, so again, hello to everybody on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Uh, Instagram. Uh, hello to those who are following me down here on my Facebook page uh, that I can't see unless I look down. And I, I won't be looking down that much, but I want to say hello to you guys. Yeah, that's that's kind of funny, right? I don't know. I'm trying to position this thing. You know, I'm trying to rearrange my my, my basement office area uh, to be conducive to do a, a plethora of things. And so again, so we're talking, we're going into Jeremiah chapter 45. And so I want to share that about the tabernacle. And just some other things, right? We've had some discussions going in today. As you know, we're getting into the season that most, some of y'all, Pam says I switched. <laughs> That's my girl. Uh, most of y'all know that I don't do, I don't do, we don't celebrate uh, uh, Halloween. We don't teach Halloween. It's witchcraft. And so a lot of churches will still do things for Halloween to keep church members, to keep people in. That's compromise. And we're compromising with the enemy. And a lot of times we still do things that the devil does just for the sake of that's because that's the way we was raised or we call it fun, right? And fun can get you in hell, literally fun can do that. And so there's things that I just don't do. I just don't teach. I just don't believe it's unbiblical. You know, they talk about come and then they try to make like bobbing them for apples was something that was biblical and it's not as satanic. The satanic rituals in the bobbing for the apples and all of that. You know, there's even something satanic about, um, kissing somebody under, under the mistletoe because the mistletoe is supposedly some type of an aphrodisiac or something of that nature. And there's supposed to be incantations when you kiss under the mistletoe. It's just stupid. But we do these things and we've done it for the sake of the gospel. And it's not really the gospel. And then people get frustrated, right? Because you have somebody like me that comes and teaches against it. So we we have all these different things coming at us this season. And you need to be able to applicably share the truth with somebody so they know what you're talking about. What's up, Tiny, uh, on my Instagram? So these are things that I'm trying to share. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Deacon Gary, come on. We can all we can sleep in a tent, man. I think that's gonna be cool, right? That that'll be our tabernacle each night, sleep in a tent for seven days. Uh, I'm looking forward to it myself. Um, and just to replicate it, just not us, not us, something we gotta do. It's just something I wanna do. I wanna go all the way in. So and then so again, we have October. You know, we already know about, about Christmas, and I'll probably teach how Christmas originated again this year, uh, so we can get it in our spirit. Um uh, the full moon don't have effects on people as most people think, but the full moon has has an effect biblically. You know, again, we start talking about stuff that we've heard that is a form of witchcraft or deception. Uh, there's nothing biblical that says the full moon affects people. You know, they say when the full moon, people do a bunch of killings, a bunch of murders. Uh, people have babies. I've heard different things, and I don't follow I don't follow, uh, what do you want to call it? What do you want to call it? What do you want to call it? Um, there's, I can't think of it. Uh, I can't think of it here yeah, with some soup. I can't think of what it's called, Lizette, but you know, it's kind of like this. If I don't teach it, I don't believe in it. That's basically it. If I don't teach it, I don't believe in it. So a lot of things we've been taught traditionally or we've been taught in our culture. A lot of things we teach via culture and not realize that it's not biblical, it's just something that our culture has done. Uh, the Catholic Church was good with that because what the Catholic Church would do 
the solar star is witchcraft. Uh, what the Catholic Church would do is whenever they went in to a continent or a country or city, they'll take on some of the symbolisms and some of the acts that they were doing in order to bring them into the church. Now, you got to understand, Catholic does not mean religion, even though it became a religion. The word Catholic means to gather in. So they gathered in all of these people and they gave them little hints of what they call the gospel, but yet they allowed them to do some of their satanic rituals in the church for the sake of gathering them in, right? And that's something that God, God never instituted this stuff. And I just rather stay basic biblical uh, so I can function in the biblical things of God and I don't have to worry about making no mistakes. Uh, you know, and again, a lot of things we've been taught traditionally by our culture. And some things are just not culturally correct. That's even this thing called Kwanzaa. There's no thing in the Bible with Kwanzaa, right? That's just something that I don't call them African-Americans, but there's something that black people brought up that they say it went back into history. So now we celebrate some because we want to know our blackness. Well, there's no blackness in the kingdom because in the kingdom, there was no race, just the human race. You know, in the kingdom, God said, look, he didn't have anything against intermarrying what we call races. He didn't want to intermarry religion. See, that's where the problem came in. As Solomon, he found that out with all his concubines. So anyway, we got all these things coming up uh, that are detrimental to us being separate and walking fully, excuse me, in the things of God. It's just crazy. And some of you, I sent some stuff out today, this morning, which was amazing, right? So I was listening to somebody teach something, and then I went to really research it. And it's funny, you know, because the enemy always attacks before, before we move into his promises, and we have to watch that. You always have to be careful that once the enemy knows or has an idea that God is going to bless you, reposition you, or move you up, he always throws in something. He always throws in a tactic. And what you have to watch is the tactic didn't just start at that time. He eases it in, and when it's time, he attacks. So it's kind of amazing. I, sh I sent some stuff to several of you, uh, some of you that I know would pop it up, and it's kind of funny. The enemy attacked Adam and Eve before Adam and Eve had kids, right? So they actually hadn't known one another yet. You know, to know one another in the Bible means to have sex. They hadn't actually hadn't known one another yet because the Bible says after they were kicked out of the garden is when they started having children. Now, isn't it ironic they had a good child and an evil child because they partook of the tree of good and evil. They had a good child and an evil child, right? Now, it's amazing, excuse me, and the reason he did that, if you think about this, we're all seeds of Adam. All of us came from Adam. So if you think about that, if they would have had a child prior to the enemy attacking them, then there would have been one righteous seed which would have lived on forever. So the enemy was cunning enough to say, I need to get them before they know one another so I can prohibit them from having a righteous seed, which is what he did. I say that so you can understand, you have to have, you have to be, you have to open your eyes, you have to open your spiritual eyes. Anytime God is getting ready to bless, here comes John or here comes Sue and they throw you off or, or here comes a, a, a job that God told you not to apply for. He told you to stay where you're at, but this job looks good. But he didn't tell you to go there. But the enemy knows if you stay here, you're going to double your money, right? You're going to double your position. But he always throws something at you that looks good, right? And I always try to tell people, stay focused. Oh, no, no. You know, that's what they'd be like. Dad, I don't need to hear you. You know, you just don't want me to do nothing. You don't want me to be married. You don't want me to get a better job. You don't do this. And then you get in and it's like, oh, sure. You know, I'm in this relationship. Maybe I should have stayed. Maybe I should have did like God told me to do and stay single and stay separate and, and just and just seek out his face. It's kind of like, you know, again, like I shared the other week, you know, we've been taught and I've taught it myself uh, for a lot of years that God is preparing a man for you, for the women. That's not right. <laughs> you know, God prepared Eve for Adam. Right. And, and some of y'all went in unprepared. You just jumped at something that said, I do. Right. You unprepared. But God prepares you for your man. So if you don't have one yet, don't worry about it. Just stay still. And, and what is God preparing you for? Or are you allowing him to prepare you? <laughs> well, that's deep right there. Are you allowing him to prepare you? Are you still straddling the fence? Trying to do it your way. 
See, all these things come up, right? And I'm just that preacher to teach and talk about them, and most people don't. So we got that issue, right? I'm, and I'm just talking. Y'all y'all don't mind me talking, do you? Can I talk a little bit? If you don't mind, I sure appreciate it. Now, if you don't want to hear this, okay, I'll go. And just so, again, today, Jeremiah chapter 45, able to a couple of verses, then we're going to do 47. Don't worry, we have you out of here by 8.30, 8.45. Uh, we started at 7.45, so I still need my hour, right? Yeah, man. So it's a lot of things, and there are things that people don't know while I teach, and so if you get in the conversation, you can share it with other people. Like today, uh, I was talking to a lady in the bank about tabernacles, and she was enjoying that because she knows that I'm a believer, not a Christian. I'm a believer. So she got all excited. Now, her pastor's in Georgia. She's up here in Virginia. But now she wants to visit the church because she heard, right? It's kind of ironic. Uh, I had a chance that my neighbor was reading a book. Didn't come to find out my neighbor's kingdom. I said, dude, I've been teaching kingdom. That's the way I roll. And me and him started talking. I said, see, we right next door, right? And everybody on the same sheet of music. That's how we roll like we do. Right. And then I go to the store. Right. I go to Publix. I, I did this lady had, had did this meat for me personally. It's good to know people in the talk. Right. Because the, the butcher did a, a specific meat thing for me today. Now, they normally put it out, but she made sure that mine was separated today. God is good. Favor is fair, baby. And so me and her started talking. I say, so here we go again with this Christmas thing. I don't believe in it. It's just a holiday. It has nothing to do with Jesus' birthday. I don't care whether they're trying to call it that or not. It's not that. But then they tell a lie about the apple. There's no one in the Bible that says what kind of fruit he had. It's not in there, right? And we still talk about, you know, the apples and, and Eve ate the apple off the tree. It doesn't say what kind of fruit it was, but we keep lying. Right. But my other point was, Chris, they're talking about three wise men. There wasn't three wise men. And they, when they say three wise men, they always say it was a, 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 a black man, a white man and an Asian man. And I'm like, that's a bunch of baloney, like a ham and cheese sandwich or something. man. That don't make no sense. And so what happens is we keep following up with the same thing. But I don't. Right. That's why I teach. And so I shared it with the lady. I said, well, that's a lie. She said, really? I said, yeah, it wasn't no three wise men. She said, really? I said, no, it's probably about 15 of them. She said, well, I said, that's what they did. They traveled and made kings. I said, so understand when Herod was scared, Herod was scared for a reason because they didn't come by themselves. They came with some, some meat, some substance. They came with some, 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 some swords, some sabers, if you will. They, they came to kick somebody's behind if they touched these wise men. And I said, they look like this. Right. They was Persians. They had dark skin. There was no white man, black man, and no Asian. Right. But we keep teaching. I'm oh, sorry. They keep teaching these lies and people in the church keep accepting it. But no three. Matter of fact, Jesus wasn't that small. He wasn't. He wasn't. You know, he's probably about a year old, close to two years old. Right. When they finally got there because they traveled following the star. It's all this. Ugh, all this stuff. Now, they did bring the gifts. That's why they had all them guys around. Them, right. You can't you ain't gonna rip them off. But these are just little things that, that I'm just I'm just throwing out, you know, prayerfully it, it helps you. Uh, these are things that we have to deal with. And uh, again, just learn. I, I teach like this so we can learn the truth. Because churches keep lying <coughs> and pastors keep perpetrating this lie for the sake of fellowship. Right. And it's not about fellowship. I keep saying where Pam said with some soup, and I'm trying to think what she what I was talking about. What she wanted some soup with, because I done got hungry now, and I'm thinking about soup. So <laughs> I know I, I need help. I need help. I need help. So let's get into Jeremiah. I just wanted to share a few things. You know, I'm dumb tonight. If you got a question, I'll probably keep on going. But uh, yeah, just just things, right? That we need that we need to, we need to take an account of. And I teach like this. I share like this. If you don't believe what I'm sharing, it's fine. Look it up. Research. I dare you. Matter of fact, I challenge you to research, to search it out and see if I'm not telling the truth. Uh, because the only, only reason I teach is because, you know, I feel like, you know, for a couple of thousand years, we've been fabricated to. Right. Uh, and still, why that's why we teach kingdom. That's why we believe in kingdom, because that's what Jesus said. Over 170 times, 150 times, he re he 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 makes this statement about kingdom. Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, me and Deacon Gary camping out with some soup. Oh, girl, somebody bring some grilled cheese sandwiches, but I sure appreciate it. Um, you know, we, we keep we keep reference, referencing referencing stuff that we heard in our past that have no, no weight, right? And so then we come, Kingdom Expectations, my fellowship pastors that listen, uh, the pastor to pay attention, we come with weight. 
and go against what they've been said. We go against the status quo because the status quo has not been correct, right? And that's what God, he didn't ask us to compromise, right? I don't have to celebrate Halloween just to keep you in the church. That's a compromise. I'm not going to compromise, right? I'm not going to sit up here lying and tell you no fat cat coming down my chimney. And this is Jesus' birthday. No, his birthday is in between the months of September and October. And he didn't tell you to worship his birthday. Why are we worshiping something he didn't tell us to worship? He didn't tell us to worship his birthday. Right. If he would have told us to worship his birthday, then the date would have been in there. Does it make sense to you? Right? If the date would have been in there. But he didn't tell us to worship his birthday. So why are we doing something he didn't tell us to do? Right? Is it anywhere in the Bible that said to worship Halloween? That Halloween don't have nothing to do with God anyway. That's kind of like Easter with the rabbits and the bunnies. I, I had problems with that as a kid until I finally learned the truth. Why y'all lying to me? Right? And everybody's dressed up and messed up and fessed up. And, you know, first thing a parent tell a kid is don't lie to me. But yet you tell me Santa Claus coming down the doggone chimney and you better be good and you better not be bad. Right? <sighs> it don't make no sense. And people still want to do the wrong thing, think they're going to get the right blessing. I think it was... um. Not Isaac Newton. What's the guy's name? Einstein. Y'all know Einstein was a believer. First and second law of thermodynamics comes through the first three chapters of Genesis. Uh, heat and ent entropy and all that good stuff. It's just amazing. Quantum theory comes out of the Bible, too. Oh, man, there's, there's several leaps in the Bible. Oh, man, it's just amazing, right? Now y'all over here getting hungry, bringing cash iron. It's just amazing to me how these things have perpetrated through the years. And once the truth comes out, people be scratching their head. I'm just trying to help. So let's get into Jeremiah chapter 45. Because, you know, I, I can talk all night. Uh, that's just that's just the way I do. Uh, so look, so in going into Jeremiah chapter 45, we're in a slightly different period. And uh, this particular period is appended after the other lessons that I've given. So basically, that basically means that it's not necessarily as always in chronological order. Right. And you'll see that shortly because of the differences in the, of the different type of subject that's getting ready to come out. You can see that where it's placed, it should have been earlier, right? But uh, 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 but that's how it's supposed to be. That's right, Dr. Carolyn. People get more celebration than God does because it wasn't his birthday. It's nothing biblically instituted that says that we're supposed to serve uh, God, worship his birthday on December 25th. It was brought about by Constantine and the motherboards. We know that December 25th is during the winter solstice. It's one of the high times of satanic worship. There's several times that Satan can show himself bodily, right? And one of them is Easter, <laughs> and one of them is Christmas. That is the only time, because he's not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at all the time. That is the only time that those who worship Lucifer, according to where they're at, he can appear bodily. And there's only, I know it's Easter, and I know it's Christmas. Christmas is the winter solstice. It deals with the sun and the moon, right? Never had anything to do with God. But now, in order to get people away, right, to from doing that and coming to the church, they incorporated that with the church to make it seem like it was biblical. Right? Then we got all these issues. Now, remember, because when I taught you this last year, uh, St. Nicholas himself was a guy in a black suit with black hair that rode on an eight-leg horse. Maybe that's where the eight reindeer came from. You just got to watch all this stuff, man. We just compromise. You know, I just tell people, do you celebrate Christmas? No. That's just a time when you give gifts to people, right? But I tell people, if you love me, again, don't wait to Christmas to give me something, right? You can give me something all during the year. I, I celebrate you regardless, right? That's how I do. Anyway, let's go back to Jeremiah 45. Uh, so, again, it's not a chronological order. So, the subject... Up until now, up until now, the subject matter that we've been dealing with has been Judah. Uh, Jeremiah himself had the burden of presiding over the death of his own nation. And that's that's heavy, right? Because he had to let his people know, y'all gone, bro. Y'all y'all out of here. That's a heavy weight. You know, it's, it's amazing. There's some things that my wife has seen from a prophetical side, and it's heavy. Uh, she even saw her mother's death, and that was, that's, that was, that was heavy on her for years. Uh, she didn't speak for a couple of years after that because it was so heavy. God shows prophets some things, man. People are, I want, I'm a prophet. No, you're not. You know, you, you're a nut. That's what you are. You just sit your hiney down. And I don't understand prophets that can't see anything, but that's that's a whole other subject. So, so, so Jeremiah had this issue to whereas he was speaking judgment upon his own nation, and he was watching his own nation die. That's that's a hard thing to pay attention to because he had to tell them that judgment was coming and that they were going to be made slaves for Babylon. 
uh, they was going to be slaves for 70 years. It all happened, just like he said. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Now, it wasn't a popular ministry. His ministry was very agonizing, actually, right? And that's why Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. Yeah, because of that ministry. That's an agonizing ministry. That's not popular. You know, and sometimes people don't understand. It's not popular sitting in this position. You know, everybody's great. Everybody grandorizes. I probably messed that word up, but I, you know what I mean. Everybody makes it grand to be an apostle. No, no, if you're really an apostle, it's, no, it's nothing grand. No, no, because you see too much, right? And people be lying right in your face and you can't say nothing. People tell you they love you in their face. You know, they lie. They love you as long as you're doing something for them. But behind your back, they're always talking about you. I don't know why. I don't know who you think he is. Yeah, don't do that. Don't say that. Yeah, right. But you love me, right? In my face. I hear your conversations. Right? It's kind of sad, but you know, that's what happens when you have the, when you sit in this seat and everybody acts like it's a grand place to be. No, it's not grand, right? Because you got to teach people, you got to talk to people, you got to correct people. Loving is easy, right? I would love your shoes off of you. You understand what I'm saying? But the correction is hard. Correction is not something that I love doing, but it's of a necessity to correct, right? And you might say, you know, I'm a grown man. I'm a grown woman. That makes no difference. God said to correct you, right? So it's not all this pomp and status, right? It's not all this glory, you know? It's not like you walk with your head up. I walk with my head up when you do great things. I'm proud of you. I put my little tails out like a peacock. You know, I flap, ah, ah. Like, yeah, I do that, right? But that's because I'm excited about how he's blessing you. So it's kind of rough. But anyway, going on. So let's go after chapter. Let's go back to my, my notes, man. So after chapter 44, we have this little five-verse appendage here in Jeremiah chapter 45. And so what happens is I, I need for you to uh, bear in mind that Jeremiah is not in chronological order, as I said earlier. And I always reemphasize that. It's literally a compilation of his various writings. Now, remember, there wasn't books. These were letters. Right? These were letters. These were not books. It became books or chapters or whatever later. Actually, it became books, chapters, and then they divided into verses. Uh, so all this is going on. So chapter 45 was a special message, is a special message to Barak, uh, Baruch, rather, B-A-R-U-C-H. And remember, that was his scribe. Uh, he was a grandson of Messiah, who was the governor of Jerusalem under Josiah, the good king. You see that in Second Chronicles chapter 34, verse 8. His brother himself was the chief chamberlain in the in the court of Zedekiah, and you see that you'll see that rather in uh, chapter fifty one, verse fifty nine. Uh, Baruch, while he was professionally a scribe, was also apparently, as we see, of noble birth. So he wasn't just a scribe, right? He was a scribe from noble birth. So let's go into this real quick. Uh, Jeremiah chapter forty five. I'm going to make an attempt. I've been on here now 18 minutes. It's 8 11. I'm going to make a attempt to do 46 as well. We'll see how we roll. I might just do 45 and say good night. Uh, <laughs> it's, going to how, it's going to how I feel tonight. So, Jeremiah chapter 45. The word that Jeremiah the prophet spoke unto Baruch, uh, the son of Neriah, when he had written these words in a book of the. <laughs> when he had written these words in a book at the mouth of Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, so, so basically, when Pharaoh Necho himself first asserted himself, he put Jehoahaz in charge, but he only did that for 90 days. And then he put Jehoiakim in charge, and Jehoiakim, as we know from reading, was bad news. Uh, a major duration of the rulership was under Jehoiakim. Now, Jehoiakim was succeeded by Jeconiah or Jehoiachin. You know, you can reverse Jeconiah or Jehoiachin. It's the same, same individual. Uh, just name changes, right? But only for a short time. He was subse subsequently replaced by Zedekiah. Y'all know Zedekiah had no bones at all. And that displacement was by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, ne yeah, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, now, this is the writings that Baruch did during his earlier king, Jehoiakim. So these are earlier writings that Baruch had already done himself, right? Verse 2 and 3. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto thee, O Baruch, thou didst say, Woe is me now, for the Lord hath added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing and I find no rest. So basically Baruch is ex exhausted, right? He's anxious, he's worried, he's, he's concerned. Verse four, thus shalt thou say unto him, uh, the Lord saith thus, behold, that which I have built will I break down and that which I have planted I will pluck up, even this whole land. And seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not, for behold, I will bring evil upon all flesh, saith the Lord, 
but thy life will I give unto thee for a prey in all places, whether thou goest. Thy life will I give unto thee. What's up, Dirty Red? Uh, so this is a strange type of encouragement as we come out of this real quick. This is a strange type of encouragement. Now, you have to bear in mind that Baruch is faced with replacing the copy that the king had burnt. You remember that? I think it's two or three chapters earlier uh, when I Jer Jeremiah told Baruch to take it to the king for him to read it, and the king burned it up. So then he told Baruch to reread it, to rewrite it. Now, here's intelligence, right? Because he got this word directly from Jeremiah. It did not say that Jeremiah reread or reinstated what he had said. It says that Baruch gave the king the letter. The king burned up the letter, and Jeremiah said, go and rewrite what you wrote. Think about it. So that means he had to remember everything that he wrote to the letter. He could not deviate. I think that's amazing, right? That's just intelligence to a whole nother level, right? So let's let's go to so so basically uh, because of that, apparently he got discouraged, very discouraged, and so the word of encouragement uh, to him at this time is kind of out of order. It happens to be right here in this place where it needs to be. That's why it seems to be out of order because of the fact he had to rewrite something. He was frustrated, but then they placed this compilation of that particular letter here. In Jeremiah chapter 45. Strange, of course. So what he does is he reminds him that God is in charge and he's going to put up, he's going to put up and take down as he will. So it makes no difference. God's in charge. Exemplified in the next four to five chapters prophetically as far as the nations around Israel are concerned. So there's some people that God's going to exemplify, but the ones he's going to condemn, he said, look, check it out. I put up who I want to. I bring down who I want to. There's no if and ands or buts about this. So basically, this is considered to be at this particular time a wrong time for personal ambition uh, because it's a crisis time, not the time to be making long-term plans. So if we look at the parallel passages, uh, we see the days of Elisha. We see the uh, Elisha, rather, uh, Gehazi, Elisha's servant, deceived Naaman to his own advantage, and Elisha scolds him because it was not the appropriate time for Gehazi to be looking out for himself. We see that in 2 Kings 5 and 26. There's a similar passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 29 and 31. So normal plans will be overshadowed by the crisis times in which they will live. Just in other words, God said, look, don't make these plans that you think that you're making. You need to make plans according to what I'm going to do, right? And what I'm going to do, you going into slavery. So these plans that you got for Judah, you need to hold off on them, bro, because that ain't going to work. And that's basically, that's basically what he's telling them. Uh, because it's a crisis, right? And so we see that, again, uh, Elisha tried to do that with Gehazi. So that's all these things came about. So basically, he says that his life is secure. That's his encouragement. Baruch, your life is secure. Now, all those around you, they're not secure. Your life is secure. Now, it may not sound like much, but these are the days of the Babylonian captivity. The city is under siege. It's essentially putting Baruch under God's special protection. So Baruch does not have to be concerned with his life, but it is not the time for other concerns because they're not about to enter or encounter the events that we talked about in the last chapter two, where Nebuchadnezzar does succeed and they're forced to go to Egypt. So he's basically telling Baruch, look, you good. It's going to be all right. Uh, you're protected. But I'm sending them to Babylon. And the ones that don't go to Babylon and they fight against Babylon, I'm killing them. Sorry, I'm the Lord. I do what I want to do. I gave him a warning. That's basically it. So let's do Jeremiah chapter 46 real quick. We got time. Y'all y'all, y'all be okay. I pray y'all be okay. Uh, so let's do this. Um, right. I'm still reading notes. Not somewhere. Y'all got to hear. So we, we now want to deal with chapter 46. I, I should be 46 through 49, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to just do chapter 46 and we're going to say good night. Unless y'all got questions, which I doubt. Nobody ever wants to ask me. You know, it's funny. Why nobody ever wants to ask me questions? I like answering questions, but that's another subject. So chapters 46 through 49, you're going to see that they're just a tad bit different because they're not directed against Israel. These are particular prophecies as we get into 46 through 49 that are given through Jeremiah to a group of nations. So now it's international. Right. It's not just Israel. Now, now it's getting ready to become international. Now, some Bibles may have this organized as, as either nine or ten, depending on how they're counted. So in these particular nations, there's going to be Egypt. There's going to be Philist Philistia, 
Moab, Ammon, Edom, Damascus, which, which implies Syria, then Kedar and Hazar, which should probably be separated into two. So but there's some Bible scholars, though, that have them clustered together as Arabia. Uh, Arabia was not a cohesive nation at that particular time, so it would actually be these two nations, Kedar and Hazar, with the tribes that make up Arabia. Uh, and the last one is Elam. That gives us 10. Uh, I could slide, but I'm going to stay in this. You know, that's kind of like Hamas and all these cats in Israel. Hamas was not a nation, right? Uh, so that goes back. These were nomads. These were tribes who were nomads. And so what happened was, um, I can't think of this guy's name. They made a movie after this guy. Uh, then there was Yasser Arafat. So they talked to the British to get the British to consider them as a nation to, to have a certain portion of Israel because the British had promised Israel that they would give them back all of their land. And at that time, they were called Great Britain. But instead of them giving Israel back all of their land, they had these nomadic tribes that came together and became, uh, uh, there's another name, Hamas is one of them, which actually means trouble, uh, terrorists. Uh, ain't that amazing? Uh, but there was another couple of tribes that they made their own little nation, but they were nomadic tribes, right? And Britain gave a portion of the land of Israel, which is what they fight over today, to them, as well as the other portion of Israel, when they had actually promised to give Israel all their land back. But if you notice, anytime you go against Israel, you start falling. So, uh, you know, Britain had, had at one time had all of the colonies. You know, they had colonies everywhere, India. Uh, Australia is still a part of Great Britain. Uh, Canada is a part of Great Britain. Uh, they had India. They had all these other little islands and everything. And they slowly after that started losing power and position. They had the Bahamas. And it's just wild how, how things happen when you turn your back on the things of God. That's kind of like us. Once you understand kingdom and live in the kingdom way and understand kingdom principles and deviate from those kingdom principles, if you pay any attention, you know, life has a tendency of just going downhill. Right. Yeah, the Bahamas, just going downhill, right? Uh, once you know truth and you don't live by that truth, then you call an idiot. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> but the Bible says if you know to do right and you do wrong, that's sin. Simple as that. Read on, Reb. They don't want to hear that. So we have these 10 nations, right? So when Moses brought Israel out of Egypt, they faced 10 nations. Now, three of those nations uh, were put down before they crossed the Jordan under Joshua. So Joshua faced seven nations when they conquered Canaan in the book of Joshua. Now, it's interesting in the book of Revelation at the end times, the Western European nations will be aligned as a confederation of 10, right? So there's a 10 nation thing and three of them are put down first and the dictator takes place. We see that in the book of Daniel, as well as the book of Revelations, uh, chapters 13 and 17. So 10 nations, when God speaks to Jeremiah, some Bibles, again, will call it nine. Uh, so there's another point that I want to make. Jeremiah was a prophet of Israel, but in Jeremiah chapter one, verses five, he is a prophet to the nations. So it becomes plural in chapter one, verses five. Jeremiah had a worldview and he served under five kings of Judah and during four different kings of Egypt and two different kings of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar inherited the kingdom when his father died during the first siege. So one of the messages that, that, that we need to recognize is that the Bible emphasizes that God is the God of all nations and he demands holiness that applies to all nations. You know. When you read about the millennial reign of Christ in, 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 in certain uh, eschatological uh, writings, and when you read about uh, the millennial reign of Christ, you read about the fact that all nations are supposed to come to Jerusalem to do sacrifices and worship Christ on the throne once a year. And if they don't come that once a year, their crops are going to fail because he's not going to allow any rain on their crops. See, this whole thing is wild, right? Because we don't realize we're going to almost go back to an agrarian society when Jesus comes down and reigns for a thousand years because he's the computer system himself. So everybody's going to have to worship him. If you don't worship him, you, you just stuck on stupid and leaning on dumb, right? And these are all nations. Jacob was still alive. No, 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 no. Jacob, Jacob was, Jacob was. Jacob was dead. Remember, the tribes of Israel was Jacob's sons, Isaiah. So Jacob was gone a long time ago, about, about a thousand years. Yeah, 800 to a thousand years. Jacob was out. He was out of the picture. Now I got to think. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was gone 
a, a few hundred years, he was already gone. Boom. So let's go in 46. Uh, uh, this particular passage that we're going to deal with is going to deal with Pharaoh Nico, uh, his invasion against the king of Babylon. He was crazy. Now, at that particular time, Egypt is a powerful nation that we're getting into. And Babylon is on the rise. It's like this little nation is coming up, right? So Pharaoh Nico himself is the man that engages in the battle at Megiddo. Now, Megiddo here is a location where Pharaoh Nico slays King Josiah, the good king, about 609 B.C. And he placed Jehoiaz on the throne three months later. And he removes him and imprisons him that Ribla and Jehoiakim is now in charge, right? So we have this, this battle, and this is one of the main, you know, biblical scholars call this a main battle. It's the Battle of Karshemish. Uh, again, if you ever get into a biblical, you ever notice how some people never get into biblical conversations because they don't, they don't know the Bible. They've not been taught the Word of God. And so sometimes you might find somebody that you, that you can talk to about this stuff that we teach. So the fourth year that Jehoiakim is in charge of the battle, of caution, is Pharaoh Nico gets defeated by a young general that's in charge of the Babylonian army. That young general happens to be Nebuchadnezzar, right? Uh, the battle alters the subsequent course of history in the world, literally. That, that's why they talk about the Battle of Karshim, because it flips everything, right? Pharaoh Nico and Egypt from that time on are contained, and Babylon is one on the rise. So it's, it's like the, the changing of authority. Ever so many hundreds of years, or it's not even a thousand, I don't think. I think it's been a thousand lately, but every every several hundred years, nations switch places. I mean, like at one time, America was the cat's meow. Now America is the meow. We're not even the cat, right? I'm just being honest with y'all, and y'all need to pay attention. I know some of y'all don't look at the news. It's okay. America used to be the, the everybody feared America, right? Until that incident we happened, happened when we pulled them, them, uh, them people out of our... Uh, um, was that Afghanistan? And them soldiers got killed, right? When when he messed that up, America was once feared. America is no longer feared. So there has to be a change of the guard because every so many hundreds of years, it changes, right? So we're in the midst of a change. How about that one? We're in the midst of a change. And you can look at that biblically, spiritually. It, all, it makes no difference how you look at it. Just just know that that's what's, that's what's going on. Uh, hey, Pastor Carlos, Brother Marvin, how y'all doing over down there? Uh, uh, yeah, we've been leaning to our own understanding, uh, Prophet Marvin. So, yeah, we're in the midst of a change of nation. So let me get 46 out of here. Who do, so 46, chapter, 46, verse 1. The word of the Lord, which came to Jeremiah the prophet against the Gentiles, against Egypt, against the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, which was by the river Euphrates and Karshemis, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, smote in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah. Uh, order ye the buckler and shield and draw near the battle. Harness the horses and get up, ye horsemen, and stand forth with your helmets. Furbish the spears and put on the brigantines. Wherefore have I seen them dismayed and turned away back? And their mighty ones are beaten down and are fled apace and look not back. For fear was round about, saith the Lord. Let not the swift flee away, nor the mighty man escape. They shall stumble and fall toward the north by the river Euphrates. So basically, this is a reference, if you will, of the Babylonian strength that's now surfacing. And so what happens is um, they are tauntings, or, or these are taunts by Jeremiah against Egypt. So bear in mind that Jehoiakim and the leaders were pro-Egypt and Jeremiah is pointing out that they're going to lose and that Jeremiah is called by God to win. So again, Jeremiah says one thing and they're trying to say, no, nah, Jeremiah, you're lying. And so he's kind of like taunting them because like, I tried to tell you, Egypt is not going to be your, your, your friend. They cannot de defeat Babylon. God is going to make cause Babylon to beat them. And they're like, oh, Jeremiah, we don't pay you no attention. Yeah, that reminds me of the church. If I tell somebody something, well, we ain't going to pay you no attention. You know, can I say this? Don't y'all get offended. It's the truth, though. It's a lot of times I watch when me and my wife might share a word of correction or direction that people don't want to go in. They don't never want to say they missed it, right? But I sit back and watch. I guess that's pride or whatever. And I sit back and be like, see, all I had to do was pay attention. All I had to do was pay attention. But you wanted to figure it out. And, and I'm of this. This is just me personally. Y'all pray for me tonight. I, I sure appreciate it. If I knew that I sat up under a man or woman of God that really sought the face of God and could hear clear, 
I, I'm whatever they tell me to do, I'm gonna do it. I'm I'm just gonna do it. You know, again, I remember uh 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 several months ago, not so a couple of years back, right? Y'all know I was gone. I was going to work, applications done the whole nine yards, right? I was gone and put it in. I was going to get out of here. And I called Dr. Rick and I said, So Dr. Rick, here's where I'm at. Here's what I plan on doing. And uh Dr. Rick always asks a qu- answers a question with a question, right? I like that. Uh, cause I understand that. I hate it. But you know, I understand why he does it. So he always asks a question with a question. So he said, Well, Doc, what did the Lord say? I said, Well, you you I don't know. He said, Well, uh, uh, really, what did the Lord say? I said, Well, to be honest with you, he said, Well, I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna say. And I, I got an idea what the Lord said, but I, I think you should wait and stand because you're working in your gift and the enemy doesn't want you to see that. I need you to wait and stand. Now, you know, I was looking at making $120,000 a year, right? I'm like, you know, I could pay my house off in two years, right? I see all this stuff. Y'all know how we do, right? And But he said, I, I believe you need to wait and stand. I said, okay. And of course, that's what the Lord had told me anyway, but I wanted to do it my way, right? But I, I, I waited, I, I stayed, right? So anytime I'm getting ready to make a decision like that, Something that's that that's that's has something to do with ministry, myself, family wise. I always go to him and ask him for the you know, this is I'm, I need you to pray about this, right? And then me and him will he'll consult me when I go to him to make sure I make the right direction, right? Because I'm, I'm it's too late in the game to mess up. Can y'all say amen? It's too late in the game, even in your life, it's too late in the game to mess up, right? We don't want to be like Judah, it's too late in the game to mess up, it's too late in the game to miss God. Because he's in a season of open doors. It's too late in the game. I'm getting emotional. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's too late in the game to miss God. It's too late in the game to be caught up with your emotions. It's too late in the game. Not now. Not with open doors. Not with open doors. No, it's too late in the game, baby. Not now. You should have messed up two years ago. Too late in the game now to think that you got it going on, Marvin. I don't mean Marvin because there's Prophet Marvin on there, but that's just the songwriter. It's too late in the game. You know, what's going on? Sit down. It's too late in the game. So, sorry about that. I don't even know what verse I'm on now. Yeah, here we go. Here, verse 7 and 8. God, I, I, I love that, you know, but I don't feel like ministry. I, I might have to. We'll see. Ah, help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Now I can't see a thing, y'all. It's funny. All this is live, just like I'm in church. I can't see nothing. Ah, it's too late in the game, right? I would not be involved in anything that prohibits me from seeking the face of God. Nope. Anything, anyone, any situation, I would not be attached to anything that's not going where I'm going. Nope. It's too late in the game. I, I don't need no hindrances. All I need is flow, right? I don't need nothing to prohibit me from walking in his promises, walking in that open door. All I need is flow. If you're not flowing with me, right, building me up, edifying, strengthening me, if you're not projecting me, eh, you got to go, right? That's just like, you know, I, I said that today, you know, access, access does not mean you have all of me. Access means you now can work to get the fullness. You know, uh, and, and people take access for granted. So I, I don't. I don't take access to Dr. Rick for granted. I don't take access to God for granted, right? Because it's detrimental for my growth. It's detrimental for my health. It's detrimental for my progress. Everything, every relationship, every conversation is detrimental for my progress. Every handshake, every hug, every prayer, every hand laid on is detrimental to my process. I will make sure that I align myself with those who are pouring into my process, right? Pouring into my process. If you're not pouring into my process, if you're taking away from me, we don't have time. And time is everything. So let me go on before I run my mouth too much. Y'all don't want to hear all that. Verse 7 and 8. Who is this that cometh up as a flood, whose waters are moved as the rivers? Egypt rises up like a flood, and his waters are moved like the rivers. And he saith, I will go up and will cover the earth. I will destroy the city and the inhabitants thereof. Come up, ye horses, and rage, ye chariots, and let the mighty men come forth. The Ethiopians and the Libyans that, that handle the shield, and the Lydians that handle and bend the bow. Now, 
Notice now when we're talking about Ethiopian, when we're talking about these cats here, uh, we're, we're, we're talking about cushion put, right? We're talking about, talking about cushion put. That's Ethiopia. That's Libya. Uh, we should basically think of them at this time because they're allies with Egypt. Always, we always follow the wrong people. Anyways, love something. Verse 10, 11. For this is the day of the Lord of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries, and the sword shall devour, and it shall be sat satiated and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts hath a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. Go up unto Gilead and take balm, O virgin, the daughter of Egypt. In vain shalt thou use many medicines, for thou shalt not be cured. Now, medicines, so there's an historical fact here, or historical point. Apparently, the field of medicine was introduced to Europe by Egypt and India. Now, it's an interesting reference we have in the Bible to the medicinal arts. Not to disparage them, right? The fact is that, but they're going to be no avail for the problems that they have. So they have these medicines. You know, they talked about a bomb in Gilead. Uh, and, and this particular area of the country called Gilead had this tree that produced this sap that was like a bomb, like a healing bomb. And so even here, they're talking about, look, uh, where you're going at was a place of healing. They had certain medicinal uh, things there as far as bombs and trees. But that ain't going to help you because what I'm getting ready to put on you can't nothing help you. No medicine can help you is basically what the scripture saying. Verse 12, the nations have heard of thy shame and, and the, thy cry hath filled the land for the mighty man hath stumbled against the mighty and they are fallen uh, both together. So now what we have is, if you will, uh, Jeremiah's um, poetic way. I'm going to say Jeremiah's poetic soul. So if God said it, you had better set your cushion and stay put. You stupid. <laughs> Deacon Jerry ain't got no sense, y'all. I mean, Deacon Gary ain't got no sense. He said, if God said it, you better sit your cush down and stay put. I'm out. I, I love it. I love it in life. God, I love y'all. Um, so Jeremiah has this poetic, poetic way, if you will, of describing the futility of Egypt going against Babylon. So there's going to be ultimate destruction, as I've said earlier, uh, and almost a taunt that they're going to go down. So while this is directed Egypt, Jeremiah is trying to convince Jehoiakim. Uh, not to make an alliance with Egypt because Egypt was going to lose. So he's trying again to warn them. Sometimes people just don't pay attention to warning. The word that the Lord spake to Jeremiah the prophet, how Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, should come and smite the land of Egypt. Declare ye in Egypt and publish in Migdal and publish in Noph and Taphnes, say ye, stand fast and prepare thee for the sword shall devour round about thee. So now again, this prophecy here again is aimed at Egypt's heartland. Now, it's kind of different than the conflict earlier with Pharaoh Necho and Babylon or the Babylonian, which was fulfilled in most scholars in the eyes of it. it in most scholars eyes, it was fulfilled at the Battle of Karshemish. But now this is subsequent to that. So after the fall of Jerusalem, once again, Nebuchadnezzar focuses on Egypt. Right. Thinking that they would be safe in Egypt, Jeremiah and Baruch were forced by this rebel group to go. Now, we read that in chapter 44, right? Because Jeremiah didn't want to go. And so he, they, the, the guys came back and they killed the dude that was supposed to be set in place by King Nebuchadnezzar's um, general to run over the place of Judah that they had already damaged anyway. And he set him in charge and this other dude came and killed him. And they caused all the people there to be captive and to take them to Egypt against their own desire. So Jeremiah's in that group. Him and Baruch is in that group. So the point is, like, even though they thought they can disappear to Egypt as well, uh, Nebuchadnezzar like, no, I need to get Egypt on out my way because they keep harassing me. So, so again, Nebuchadnezzar is still going to get Egypt. Now, most scholars feel that this gets fulfilled seven years, several years rather, after the fall of Jerusalem. And the cities here are the cities we reviewed. Uh, before pretty much uh, going into Egypt. And that was like chapters 42, 3, and 4, verse 15 through 18. Why are they valiant men? Why are thy valiant men swept away? They stood not because the Lord did drive them. He made many to fall, yea, one fell upon another, and they said, Arise and let us go again to our own people, and let, I'm sorry, own people, and to the land of our nativity from the oppressing sword. And they did cry there, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is but a noise. He hath passed the time upon it. As I live, saith the king, whose name is the Lord of hosts, surely as Tabar is among the mountains and as Carmel by the sea, so shall he come. 
So now Daniel chapter four and chapter 10 make broader, make a broader point that God is the God of all the nations. And he'll put up who he wants to and bring down who he wants to. O thy daughter dwelling in Egypt, furnished thyself to go into, into captivity. For Nob shall be waste and desolate without an inhabitant. Egypt is like a very fair heifer, but destruction, <laughs> heifer, that's my, used to be my favorite word, another subject. Uh, Egypt is like a very fair heifer, but destruction cometh and cometh out of the north. So now due to what we know as to be the fertile crescent geography, Babylon, even though it is way to the east, attacks from the north. Now I shared that when we first came out, started doing this New Testament, I'm sorry, Old Testament in the battle, because all these lands was to the east, right? But because of the topography, they couldn't come that way. So they all came from north. So they're actually nations from the east that are doing battle like Babylon, but the attack comes from the north. And that's where people get it slightly confused, if you will. Verse 21, also her hired men are in the midst of her like fatted bullocks, for they also are turned back and are fled away together. They did not stand because the day of their calamity was come upon them and the time of their visitation. Uh, the voice thereof like go like, yeah, verse 22. <laughs> and the voice thereof shall go like a serpent for they shall march with an army and come against her with axes um, as hewers of wood. So again, there was a serpent. Now watch this. There was a serpent. Uh, was on the Egyptian banners. This is the banners of Egypt. Commentators point out the word play. So in the English, we miss that often through these places in the Hebrew, there are puns and plays on words. And you know, I share that with you quite often. So be aware that we're dealing with a translation, right? The Babylonians did use battle axes, right? As we just read. Now, here's the funny thing. Battle axes in those days were bizarre. It was different. It was a surprise. Common in medieval times, and but this goes back six centuries before Christ. So the battle axe itself was a peculiar weapon that only the Babylonians introduced. And it was an aspect of awe to come against because nobody was accustomed to it. So back in the days, in these particular days, they used arrows. Everything was a bow and arrow or they threw a spear. And the Babylonians came out here with some battle axes. And everybody like, what the devil? What's going on, right? They threw it, they did something totally different, and it wasn't something that was practiced back then. Verse 23 That should cut down her forest, said the Lord, though it cannot be searched because there are more than the grasshoppers and are innumerable. When we think of the verbiage grasshoppers, grasshoppers always deal as an idiom of a plague, right? Uh, they were without number here, they were like a, a swarm. So it's kind of like it's so many of these cats. It reminds them of a plague of grasshoppers, like a swarm is coming and taking over. They couldn't count them. The daughter of Egypt shall be confounded. She shall be delivered into the hand of the people of the north. The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, said, Behold, I will punish the multitude of No and Pharaoh in Egypt with their gods and their kings, even Pharaoh and all of them that trusted him. And I will deliver them into the hand. I will deliver them into the hand of those that seek their lives and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar is the same. Uh, king of Babylon and into the hand of his servants and afterwards it shall be inhabited as in the days of old said the Lord but fear not thou O my servant Jacob and be not dismayed O Israel for behold I will save them from afar off and thy seed from the land of their captivity and Jacob shall return and be in rest and at ease and none shall make him afraid now when we speak of Jacob we talk about the nation of Israel because Jacob's 12 sons made up the nation right so that that's basically what what they're, what they're talking about uh I think I'm on verse 28. See, I'm going to explain this. Uh, Fear thou not, O Jacob, my servant, said the Lord, for I am with thee, for I will make a full end of all the nations whither I have driven thee, but I will not make a full end of thee, but correct thee in, in but correct thee in measure, and yet will I not leave thee wholly unpunished. That's a lot, right? So let's 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 get in here real quick so we can we can close this out uh, and, and share with you this little piece. Uh, so we see now basically the, the Lord has driven them everywhere. Uh, so everywhere he's driven them, but then there's a promise to Israel, the fact that she will not go unpunished, she will be corrected, but like she will be corrected like a father corrects his child. But he's also going to punish the other nations. So he's not just going to punish Israel, he's going to also punish the other nations. So Egypt here is prophesied against twice, but what is not visible here, just for background information, is the fact that Egypt 
is the beneficiary of an ultimate promise to survive, right? She will be restored and strengthened during the millennial period. We see that in Isaiah chapter 19, verses 24 through 25. And we also see that in Ezekiel chapter 29, verses 8 and 14. Those particular verses describe an ultimate restoration in the time of blessing on the land of Egypt, right? Now, that's kind of strange, right? Because Egypt is Israel's enemy, and that's what the Exodus was about, getting them out of Egypt. But God promised Abraham the fact that I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Strangely enough, I'm sure that Egypt didn't claim that promise, but God keeps it. See, that's what I love about God. Egypt didn't claim the promise, but God kept it. Look, we do 47, 48, 49 next week. We'll see how we roll. I don't know what time it is. It's 844, right? We started at 846. So look, I appreciate y'all. Uh, I pray, I pray above, I pray to God, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I pray that you guys have been blessed tonight. I pray that you've gotten some other, some deeper, some more understanding about the word of God. Uh, I pray that I've helped you out some way, some kind of way or another. Hey, Nigel, God bless you, sir. Uh, I, I pray that you've been blessed uh, for 30 seconds, maybe 45. If anybody has any questions, I'll answer them. Other than that, I'm going to be saying good night, sweetheart. Yeah. I appreciate y'all for coming on, all the pastors, for coming on, our Florida family, North Carolina family, Colorado family, our Virginia family. I appreciate you guys being a part of the ministry, our fellowship pastors, our mentees uh, that I mentor, all of you guys. Uh, you mean the world to me. My sons, my daughters, my heart, you mean the world to me. I hope you know that by now. Uh, these are not words I try my best to express myself. I really appreciate you. It wouldn't be no you. It wouldn't be no me. That's just how we roll. So I, I thank you for being a part of Kingdom Expectations. I just thank you for the seeds that you sowed to help us to grow. Uh, I thank you for listening to your attentiveness and flowing as great gardens in the things of God. I just want to say thank you. I pray the Lord bless you. So all hearts and minds are clear. Outstanding. So as always, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his conscience upon you and grant you peace. In Jesus' name we pray. This is the Doc, Kingdom Expect Expectations Bible Exploration Class. And uh, I'm going to say peace. Shalom. See you. Thank you, Dr. Carolyn. God bless you. Good night, all. I'm going to reach up here and tuck my Instagram off. Damn.